Okay, so this is on a blank piece of notebook paper or blank smart notebook. Uh, I'd like you to try to find f plus g of x. And yes, those involve common denominators. You need to find a common denominator. And then f of g of x, that's sticking the one function in the other. And then, more importantly, tougher, find the domains of both. That's our review for the day. Do a little bit more in a moment. I'm going to pause while you give that a try. Okay, so here's how you do it. First of all, f plus g. That's 3x over 5 minus x plus square root of x plus 1. Note I'm putting it over 1. That way it has a denominator. It doesn't have a common denominator yet, but it has a denominator. Now I'm going to multiply both of them by 5 minus x, both meaning the top and the bottom. Why am I doing that? So that now this has the same denominator as that. And now I can actually add them together. And that comes up to 3x plus square root of x plus 1 times 5 minus x. We would not expect you to put that all together. All over the denominator, 5 minus x. Don't try to cancel these off now because there's not one here. This is part of an add problem, and therefore I cannot cancel those 5 minus x's that I just put in there. There's your final answer for the one plus the other using a common denominator. How many of you got that part right? Good. Next stage was... Yes, sir? Okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's right. So you might have made a little mistake in the algebra. It was pretty icky algebra. So. Next is I'm going to put the g function and the f function. That's this one goes in here. And you can't just put it in one of the x's. You've got to put it in both spots. So this becomes 3 parentheses over 5 minus parentheses. And I'm going to drop in the g function because it's eating the g function. Square root of x plus 1, square root of x plus 1. There we go. That's the one function in the other. That was actually pretty easy to set up. You might have thought that you could simplify it by maybe canceling those. You cannot because it's part of a subtract problem. So, all right. So that's it for f of g of x. Raise your hand if you had that right. Okay, good. Next part is to find the domain of that. You cannot look at this green function here and get its domain. You have to look at the parents. You might think you can do it that way, but you can't. You have to look at the parents, and the parent domains go like this. Domain of f is everything except 5. The way I would do that is set this not equal to 0 and solve. All right? Can't be 5. I'd set the under root here, x plus 1, greater than or equal to 0, so x has to be greater than or equal to negative 1. So here's negative 1, greater than or equal to that. And where do they overlap? In a couple places. They overlap from here to here and from there on. How many of you had that one right? All right. Last but not least, the f of g of x. Sir, could you get the door for us? It's getting kind of loud out there. All right. We have the domain of the inside one, which is g, intersected with g of x in the domain of the other one. That's the formula. Did you guys get that right? Did you remember that correctly? Start with the inside and then use this and this always match up, but this is the form, this is the actual function as opposed to the domain. All right, now I'm going to actually get those. Domain of g, which was, this is the g function and this is the domain of it, x greater than or equal to negative 1. Put that right here. Intersected with this goes into the other domain. Well, again, having these written out with number lines, it's really hard to put that in a number line. But if I had said x not equal to 5, now I can put it in the domain easy. I put it this in here. So I'd say the square root of x plus 1 needs to not equal 5. So then I figure out that it can't be 24. I'm going to just square both sides, x plus 1 not equal to 25, subtract 1, x not equal to 24. Then I overlap these two. 
Here's x not equal to 24. Here's x greater than or equal to negative 1. And it's about where do those overlap? So they overlap from negative 1 up to 24 and from 24 to infinity. All right, we've done those a few times now, so you should be getting better at them. How many of you feel confident on that kind of problem? Okay, good. Now, let's talk about inverses. There's two ways we did inverses. Sometimes I said just here's an equation, find its inverse. And then you flop, flip flop x and y and you solve for the, the, for the new y. But what if we just give you a picture? Do you remember me saying that it was an inverse where a flip over the line y equals x? Here it is all set up where the black one is your given function. Would you figure out for me what the inverse of that would look like? And then tell me what the domain and range of the inverse would be. You can get them from the domain and range of the original. Okay, so make me its, a, it's inverse and the domain and range of the inverse. I'll pause while you try that one. Okay, here's what you should have done on this one. 8-7 is just begging you to switch around and make it 7-8. And so that would be like up here right across the line from that, which actually makes sense. Then 0, 6 turns into 6, 0. Let's say that that's 6, 0. And lastly, negative 4, 4 turns into 4, comma, negative 4. This gets reversed. And it becomes over 4, down 4. And let's say that's uh, down here. So then that is roughly the inverse the black one. Raise your hand if you had that one right. Good. And then this next part is, I hope, easy. The domain on the black one is from negative 4 to 8. Remember, the domains are about x's. And the range is from the lowest it was, which is 4, to the highest it was, which is 7. So 4, 7, bracket. And that will then reverse. The domain becomes the range. Negative 4. No, wait. Yeah. There we go. And then the range becomes the domain, and therefore 4, 7. Any questions on that one? Yes, sir. That's not a question. Okay, sorry. All right, so my next point is to tell you how to prove two things are inverses. I know you know how to find this inverse. You switch x and y around and you solve. But I'm going to practice that with you in a minute. But first, I want to just tell you, this is how you would prove two things are inverses. If f of g of x is equal to g of f of x, and they both equal x, then they're actually inverses. That's a formula you better write down. f of g of x needs to equal g of f of x, which then will equal x. So what you're going to do is set up a little example like this. So say they had to give you this, these, this situation. Would you agree that 3 times x, or sorry, x times 3 and x divided by 3 would be inverses? Does that feel like they should be inverses? All right, so here's how you can prove that they really are inverses. Stick, if, if y, and I shouldn't really have said that. I should have said this is f, sorry, which is the same as y. And g of x, which is like y, but showing that it's a different function. Those are the two functions. Are they really inverses or not? Put the one inside the other and vice versa. And then if you simplify them down, you're going to find out they both simplify down to equal x. After you do a bunch of canceling and stuff, they should both be x when it's done. Try it. Put f in g, and you're going to get a function that's kind of complicated. Simplify it down. It'll equal x. This is how you prove something. You can't just say, yes, they are inverses. You have to actually work it out and show that when you work it all out you get x. I'll pause for a moment while you try that. Okay, so let's see if you did this right. When you put the one function in the other function, g goes into f. I'm going to start with f. 
That's f function. Without its x. And I'm going to drop in x over 3. Look at that. The 3's cancel the 3's. Cancel, cancel. And that's just x. Just like I said it would be. This one, when I put the g, start with the g function, x over 3, and then drop in the other one, 3x, once again, it just cancels. Now, are they all going to be this easy? Of course not. I just wanted to show you a simple one to start with. They both ended up simplifying to x, and if x is equal to x, then they, you have proven that they are inverses. All right, so let's do a little bit more complicated one than that. Let's say, instead of proving something that simple, how about, uh, would you find for me what the inverse of that is? Then, make that the g function. And then prove that they really are inverses. This is a way you could check your work. If you think you found the right inverse, use that formula. And if you don't have the formula, I'm not going to give you the credit for the proof. f of g of x equals g of f of x equals x. And I would do it in a t style. Do one down on the left side and one down on the right side. All right. I'll pause we give that one a try. All right, so a student has said that this is what they think that the function uh, inverse is. And I'm going to say that feels right because I see a times 3 here and I see a divide 3 over here. And I see a minus 5 here and I see a plus 5 here. So it's probably right. How can I prove it's right? Use this formula. And now I'm going to put f of x here, which is 3x minus 5, then replace the x with the other function, because it's eating the g function, x plus 5 over 3. And now the 3s would cancel, and the 5s would cancel, and that's not okay to show that all that canceling at once. Here is why. If you show all that canceling at once, I, as the teacher, cannot tell which of those slash hash marks happened first. What has to happen first? Sir. The threes have to cancel first. Because right now, I cannot just subtake that and that. They don't have the same denominators. You see what I'm saying? So if a kid cancels those first, I'm going to mark it wrong. If they cancel them all at once like this, again, I will mark it wrong. Because you didn't tell me what order to do it. And math is really important to, the, uh, to do the things in the right order. So bottom line, cancel those first, then rewrite it. Then it becomes obvious that those two can cancel each other. And then I have just x. Cool. On the other side, I start with the g function. x plus 5 over 3. I stick in the other function, 3x minus 5. And then this case, what cancels first? Can those 3s cancel? No, they cannot. What could cancel? The 5s this time. And then I write what's left. And then I show that canceling last. And yes, I got x. I got x. x is equal to x. Therefore, I have proven that those two were inverses. Okay. We are doing almost all the review today uh, instead of trying to do it in uh, chunks uh, on today and tomorrow. I'm trying to get it done today mostly. So I'm only missing a couple juniors uh, today, and hopefully they're going to watch the video either tonight or tomorrow. Uh, and I am going to miss some of you tomorrow because you're going to be doing these, uh, what is it again? Something with freshmen. A lot of freshmen are going to be doing stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, the retreat thing. So anyway, if you miss my class tomorrow, just watch the video. I'll do a little bit more review, uh, but the main bulk of it is today. All right, look at those. That, that is one function. That is one over x function. Tell me, what do you think the inverse of it is? Yes, sir? x is equal to 1 divided by y. Okay, so you're saying I should just switch the x and y around. And then let's solve for y and see what you get. Times by y on both sides. And now... Whoa! It's the same thing as it was in the first place. Now think about it. 
if you do a reflection across this line, do you get when this line reflects, it kind of spins on that line and it lands right on top of itself? So something can be its own inverse. Could you prove it? Yeah, that, that thing I just showed you. All right, we don't need to do it right now, but you could just stick f of g of x equals g of f of x and set one of these b of f of x and the other to be g of x, and you could prove that in this case. Is that true for everything? Is everything its own inverse? No, it's more, much more rare. It's a really weird, unusual exception. All right. Um, if I gave you this one and asked you to find its inverse, it has tricky algebra in it that a lot of people bomb on. It involves factoring at some point. If you can factor it, you should. So try solving this after you swip, switch the x and the y around. Try solving it for y and see if your algebra skills are up to the challenge. And then I'm going to only have you do one thing as homework tonight. The one thing as homework tonight is going to be, I'm going to get, tell you that right now in case we run out of time. The one thing for homework tonight is to take this function, write this down. This is the only thing for homework, so make a blank page at the end or something. And find the inverse of f of x. So do the inverse deal and figure out that the inverse of that is whatever and call it g of x. And then prove that they're actually inverses by using this formula, f of g of x equals g of f of x equals x. That's your only homework for tonight is that. But before you leave in class, I want to, uh, here, I'll take a snip of that, put it up on the board, I'll pause while I do So in class right now, I'd like you to try to find this inverse. And then this question appears difficult until you figure out that it's really a different question will give you the same answer that's way easier. The range of the inverse is the same as something else. All right, so find this guy's inverse, and then find the range of the inverse. I'm going to pause while you try that one. Let's see who in here is an algebra ninja. That's kind of what you need to be. First thing, this is an x, and this is a y, and this is a y. Then we're going to multiply both sides by y plus 1. Why? Because you want to get rid of fractions right away if you can. So that gets multiplied by y plus 1 on both sides, and these cancel. The right side has suddenly become pretty easy. The left side is x here times that, which makes it xy plus x. See how I got that? x times the 1 and x times the y. All right, now i got to get the y's all to one side. You could have put them all on the left side or all on the right side. doesn't matter to me. I personally like it to go this way. So I'm going to subtract 3y from both sides, and I'll have xy minus 3y plus x is equal to 2. Then if I'm going to factor this, i got to get rid of something first. What? The x. So I'm going to subtract x from both sides, and I have xy minus 3y is equal to 2 minus x. Then I'm going to divide everything well, think of it this way. It's factoring. Technically, I'm dividing by y. I'm going to take a y out, because if you can factor it, you should. And x minus 3 equals 2 minus x, and then y isn't quite alone yet. I've got to divide by x minus 3. y is equal to 2 minus x over x minus 3. There we go. Now, here's the brutal part. How am I supposed to find the range of that? Sir? Yes. Don't try to find the range of this. That's really complicated. You'd actually have to graph it, and you're not going to have a graphing calculator for this one. Uh, so how are you supposed to find the range? The only way you can get it is the domain of that. Well, the domain of that is... I'm going to get this stuff out of here. The domain of that is just the denominator. That's all I have to worry about, and it can't be negative 1. So x cannot be negative 1 is my domain of this. If this is the domain of the original, 
it's also the range of the other one. Except, what would be wrong with saying x not equal to negative 1 for its range? Because ranges are about y's. Because now x has to switch to y, because that's what inverses do. They flip-flop x and y. So your range was y cannot be negative 1. And that also implies all real uh, numbers other than that are fine for the range. Why, it, the, why that's true is because this is one of those functions that kind of looks like this. And it can't be negative 1 as it's going from bottom, from down here, up to here. It, it hits this asymptote line at negative 1. That's actually a positive 1, but it's because of an asymptote line that it makes it not work. Okay, so... We found the range of the inverse by finding the domain of the original. All right, so, yep. So what was the new thing for today? Only one thing, and it was a formula. F of g of x equals g of f of x, which has to equal x. And that's the way to prove two things are functions. You have one homework problem which I have over there. I'll drag it back onto the screen just as a reminder. This problem over here. Right there is your one problem for homework. Find the inverse of the red one, and that will call g of x, and then prove that they're really inverses by using that formula. Okay, it's all I got for you for today.